Hi everyone, and thank you for joining today's virtual educational program with Cancer Support Community Los Angeles. I am Edlyn Rodarte, and I am the program coordinator at CSCLA. I'm excited to welcome you to this week's webinar titled, How to Help Young Children Through a Loved One's Cancer. Before we begin, if this is your first time joining us, Cancer Support Community Los Angeles is a premier nonprofit organization providing vital social and emotional support to families facing cancer, including patients, caregivers, and their loved ones, all at no cost. Our programs include support groups, healthy lifestyle classes, social activities, and educational programs such as this one. If you'd like to learn more about our services or watch past webinars, please visit our website at www cancersupportla.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, please note that we cannot see or hear you. Your video and microphone are automatically disabled for this webinar. We will not be monitoring the chat room, but you may enter your questions into the Q&A feature at any time. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. You may not, we may not be able to get to all your questions today, but our presenter is invited to share their contact information at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, I'd like, a wel I'd like to welcome today's speaker. Carissa Hodgkins is the Director of Programs and Community Outreach at Bright Spot Network, which provides a program of support to parents with cancer who have young children. She has over 14 years of clinical and program experience working with families facing cancer. Prior to her position at Bright Spot Network, she was the program manager at Gilda's Club Madison for 13 years. Her professional passion is supporting kids and families who are navigating cancer, shaped largely by her father having lung cancer when she was a child and her stepfather's diagnosis of liver cancer when she was a young child, young adult. Carissa has been a member of the Association of Oncology Social Workers since 2015 and presently sits as a co-chair of the Youth Families and Cancer Special Interest Group. In addition to her present to her position at Bright Spot Network, she has a small psychotherapy practice and is a long-term lecturer at the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work at UW Madison. Welcome, Carissa. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm always happy to speak on this topic. Of course. So the floor is all yours. Sounds good. Let me get my screen share going. So you did such a wonderful job of getting through a lot of my first slides. So thank you for uh, kind of saying about me so that I don't have to waste my breath. Um, I am from Bright Spot Network. I will share a little bit more about that organization and what we do. Um, we've gotten through about me. Then I will go into a brief review of child development, talk about the challenges of a cancer diagnosis, the protective factors and resilience in kids and families tools to help kids cope, and then also some signs of distress. We are holding questions till the very end. So hopefully I might answer your question um, as I get through the slides, but if you have something that you wanna ask, um, I look forward to answering it at the very end of the presentation. So we already know about me, so we can go ahead and skip through that. I think I will just sort of reinforce that um, I was drawn to this work because of my own personal experience. It really is my heart's work to support families facing cancer. Um, and I think if I could just say one thing to especially parents out there who have cancer, it is uh, while you never wanted this, you never asked for this, um, your kids will be okay. They really will. Um, as you already probably know this, but your kids are resilient, they're strong, um, and I think they're, they probably will surprise you. And as long as they're connected to the right support um, and, and talk to very honestly, they will get through this and might even become stronger on the other end. I've seen it happen so many times throughout my practice um, where, again, families really actually get stronger through something like a cancer diagnosis. So just a little bit more about Bright Spot Network. Um, we are focused on supporting parents who have a cancer diagnosis and have young children, ages zero to six, though we do um, have kids of all ages, even teenagers. And we create a community through many different ways. Um, it happens through support groups. We have virtual support groups that are free and nationwide. We have groups for the parent with cancer who is in active treatment, for parents who have advanced stage cancer or stage four. We have groups for parents who are in long-term survivorship. And then we also have groups for the partner. 
We have some foundational programs, one of which is called Bright Reads, where parents can request free books about cancer, big emotions, um, grief and loss to help their kids understand what they're going through. Because for toddlers, preschoolers, some school-age children, books are really one of the best ways to engage in those discussions and to normalize the experience that they have. We have a bright box, which is a curated um, art box because we know for so many parents who are going through treatment or recovering from surgery, they're exhausted, but yet they still wanna feel like a parent. Um, so we'll put together all the supplies that you need and the directions, and it will give you a couple of hours to just feel like you're a parent um, again and engaging in this kind of activity with your children. And that's what this picture here is one of our parents um, and her children going through some of the crafts. We do offer a bright grant, which is a $500 barrier free grant for parents. Um, all of the all of these things you can go to our website and request and like I said, everything is offered free of charge. We do offer some for some connections for kids as well. So we do have a monthly group called Bright Circle. We also have Bright Club. So Bright Circle is for kids zero to five to come with their parent or caregiver. And it's sort of like a library circle time. So everyone, we send supplies ahead of time and then parents and kids show up on group. It's about 20 minutes. We have child life specialist um, grad students who are facilitating and it's a lot of some song and dance, some stories, some arts, crafts, activities. We have the same type of group for kids five to 12 and that group is called Bright Club and they come on their own. So that is just a really nice monthly point of connection for kids to build community. Because what I've learned working with kids these past 15 years is that they're looking for their own people as well. Just as you, know, you as adults are looking for your support team and people who really get it and who understand, kids want the same thing. They need that validation. We have other ways for them to connect, even ways that are off the screen. So we have something called Pen Pals. Um, right now, parents can sign up their kids kind of for the summer, but we may continue it because um, right now it's already very popular where we send um, like a, a box of everything they need from the, the note cards and stickers and stamps, um, everything that the kid would need to write letters back and forth. So when as kids are signed up, we'll match them with a kid of the same age, somewhere around the United States who also has either like a mom or a dad, something similar, and they can stay in touch and build community that way. Also, it's a nice way to get kids who are school-aged to practice their writing throughout the summer. Maybe that's my own um, parenting need coming out, but I like that. And then for kids who are young, you know, toddlers, preschoolers, they can color and draw pictures. We have a bright birthday, so parents can sign their kids up to get birthday cards made by our teens who have sort of aged out, but they want to give back and they volunteer and make homemade birthday cards for kids um, to just help make their day special. We offer family resource navigation. Parents can meet with me one-on-one -on -one and hear more about either local or national virtual resources that might support them and their kids. Webinars, wellness workshops. We do some events like right now we're doing some playground play date meetups around the country. And then we have a wealth of web resources um, some great uh, ask the ther therapist videos, coloring sheets, feeling wheels, all of which are on our website, free, downloadable. I'd encourage you to check them out. Okay, so just jumping in here to a review of child development that will help set the stage for uh, kind of like to, for you to start thinking where your kid might fall and what to, is to be expected of their response to your cancer. So we know that for babies and for infants, one of those key elements of development is them forming a secure attachment and creating trust with their caregiver. They have a need for consistent, warm, loving caregivers. There is that time period where they have that stranger danger. And so anyone new that's coming into their life um, often is met with lots of cries and right, babies are upset. They don't wanna be held by different people. This is all very important if you have cancer and you have an infant and all of a sudden you no longer can be holding your infant or you're trying to bring in caregivers to watch your baby while you're going to treatment or your partner's going to treatment. Um, these are probably the biggest thing um, on your plate right now is trying to figure out how to keep that consistency going and the love and the physical attachment, the touch, all of that going so that you can help your baby to meet some of these milestones. Then when you have a toddler, you know that they're starting to play with their power and their independence and their curiosity. And this is um, overwhelming and exciting all at once. So they're starting to think about their feelings and talk about their feelings, their, their needs, their wants. They have greater interest in anatomy and they're also beginning to show interest in helping. 
So if this is where your kid is at, start to think about how, you know, what might be the bigger um, issues on your plate. It could be um, how they, again, how they can be appropriately involved in helping to care for you. So like this little kid here is like helping to make maybe a healthy salad for mom or dad who is recovering from surgery or going through treatment. Um, you might be able to have, again, a little bit uh, broader of conversations, um, especially if now they can understand parts of the body. You can have a little bit more of medical um, understanding and medical uh, language. And certainly feelings, 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 talking about naming all of the feelings, what to do with those. At this age, kids are able to have uh, some of those skills. For preschoolers, they're starting to experience greater responsibility and they have greater attention spans. So they can sit for longer times to have conversations, read books, do activities, medical play. They will have enhanced perspective and awareness of others' feelings. So not just their own feelings, but they'll start to recognize others. And at this age, there's, you know, saying things like, you know, mommy, you look sad. Um, Daddy, it seems like you hurt. Like they'll really start to have a little bit more of that language and that awareness. They'll have a greater ability to role play, which is wonderful for them to express some of those feelings, those questions, those thoughts, the curiosity, um, getting them involved. It doesn't have to even be professional, but just having toys around your house that represent what you're going through. So having those toy medical kits, um, different types of dolls, puppets, um, it again, doesn't have to be an exact, exact representation, but anything where they can start playing out their feelings and uh, what's going on for them is going to be very therapeutic. And at this age, kids also can start to use words to solve problems. It's not that explosiveness that you see in the toddler realm, um, but a little bit more agency and some control over those feelings and the ability to use more, you know, cognition to problem solve. Then when you get into elementary school, you have a lot of orientation toward, towards um, following rules because that's what kids usually are doing when they're in school is paying attention to sort of, uh, you know, what, what expectations there are, what they can and can't do. They might be thinking about that regarding a parent and treatment, you know, things they can or can't do. And they might get really focused on like really needing to wash their hands or wear a mask or, you know, do certain things to be helpful. They are having even greater awareness and ability to work with their emotions, which is wonderful. They can be a little bit more self-directed, which can be great when you are absorbed a little bit in your own medical care or your loved one's medical care that you can give them sort of like a busy bag or give them something to do. Maybe they even come along to some appointments and they're able to take care of themselves a little bit more um, while, while you're having to um, you know, focus on the medical appointment. They have a strong connection to family, a sensitive um, a sensitivity to others' feelings, expanded vocabulary, storytelling, increased curiosity about the world and new information, and an increased ability to differentiate between reality and fantasy. Though I will say that even with this last one, the that abstract thought um, is it still may be far off. And I think the main point here is that even elementary school age children may have thoughts like I caused my mom or mom's cancer, my dad's cancer, because um, that magical thinking can persist quite a long time. Um, and it's so important as parents and as caregivers, anyone, you know, loved ones that are helping to support kids that they remind kids over and over again, like nothing they did or said caused their mom or dad to get cancer. So there um, was a study back in 2011 that found um, that you know almost 23% of cancer cases involved, um, I'm sorry, of young adults, so the uh, patients 21 to 55 were getting diagnosed with cancer, um, which really means this whole study really just showcases that more and more children are being affected by cancer because we're seeing um, people being diagnosed younger and we're having people that are waiting longer to have kids we're seeing this number, which at the time, um, over 10 years ago, was 2.85 million. That's continuing to grow for the number of kids that have a parent diagnosed with cancer. We also know that, of course, a child's ability to be well is directly correlated with their parents' well-being. So it's essential that we're paying attention to, to a parent's overall functioning to support children. And of course, we can support children and teens directly as well. 
But um, they, I think this is just really um, underscoring what we already know, which is it's so important to assist the entire family system and to intervene because when a parent has cancer, in my experience, usually their first concern is their kids. I can't tell you the amount of times that people would walk into Gilda's Club Madison and they would say, I was just diagnosed with cancer and immediately following it, I have kids. How are they going to do this? Like, what do I need to do for my kids? It wasn't about themselves. It wasn't about their treatment, their side effects. It was like, I need to be able to know how to talk to my kids and support them. Um, and I continue to, to find that. So usually that parent identity is really strong for the cancer patient who has children. This was a, a drawing from one of the kids in a, a kid support group that I held, the worry be gone in eight or 5,000. And I thought it was perfect to pair with this snippet of research, which again is pretty dated, 2004, but I continue to find it fascinating. What it's telling us is they, so they studied both pediatric cancer patients, so kids with cancer and kids who had a parent with cancer. And if you can believe it, the kids who had a parent with cancer had higher levels of distress than kids who had cancer. And I think that's, that's really shocking because at least for me, I would think, my goodness, I, I, one of the most difficult things I can think about is being a kid, scared of needles, scared of you know, all the poking and prodding, having cancer. That to me seems really distressing. And yet it's the kids who had a parent with cancer in this study who had higher levels of distress. In my opinion, what, you know, what the researcher said, and in my opinion, what I've seen is that I think why this happens and why the study showed this is because a lot of parents who have cancer, very well-intentioned, hide a lot from their kids. They say, this is my cancer. I don't need to burden my children. I don't need to add any worry. I just want them to be a kid. I get that. I'm a parent. I understand where that comes from. However, when children are left in the dark, they're going to make up the nightmare, the monster, the worry. It's going to be scarier. And I can guarantee you there's no way to keep it a secret. Um, kids are perceptive. They will pick up on hushed voices, extra phone calls, parents being more secretive. I mean, again, they're, they're not stupid. They're picking up on all these things. And young kids, like toddlers even, are picking up on this. So if a parent isn't talking to their kid about what's going on, a child is going to make up something far scarier than the truth and create much more distress. You know, a kid with cancer, there's no hiding it. They're a part of the whole process. So um, therein, I think, lies the difference. So if you can get one thing out of this slide and this research, it's um, be open and honest with your kids. Even young, young children need to be told the truth. We know that cancer turns up the volume of what's already there. So I've heard so often from parents, um, you know, just, I have enough on my plate, you know, doesn't that mean when I got diagnosed with cancer, doesn't that mean like everything else goes away, you know, my job stress, my relational stress, I, I shouldn't have to deal with all of that too. I wish that were the case. I wish I could give you a magic wand with a cancer diagnosis. It's like, oh, make it all go away. But unfortunately it just makes it all worse. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, that if you already, if you're going into a cancer diagnosis and you were going through a separation or divorce, a change in job, if you had some other medical or mental health issues, substance abuse, all those things, um, you'll probably see a lot of those, those challenges just get worse. It's more reason to seek help and seek support so that things don't feel like they're falling apart. Now, we also know that there are lots of protective factors. So if a family has an established sense of trust and belonging, strong family and peer bonds, that ability to use emotional vocabulary and express themselves and their needs, if they have a pretty strong functionality before cancer, connection to outside support outside of the family, and if they've already shown some resilient characteristics, which we'll get to later, they, they tend to do pretty well. And truly, this is where I see the majority of families. Um, I see them having at least one, if not multiple, of these protective factors, and it really does help to weather the storm. So I know that resilience is, you know, it's thrown around a lot. It's, it's you know, really present in the literature. Uh, and that's a good thing because more and more we're finding out that, darn it, humans in general are pretty resilient. They are resilient beings. Children in particular are very resilient. They can get through really hard times um, and, and do well. 
Anne Mastin has done a lot of research in, on this topic and she has a book called Ordinary Magic. And I like it because that's really her point is um, it's more common than we think. Sometimes on the news, it's you know sensationalized these stories about people enduring these incredible circumstances. And usually the viewer going, how did they do this? Oh my goodness, they're so strong. They're so tough. I could never do that. And yet we can, like, most of us really can. We don't know it sometimes until we really are at the precipice and are asked to step up. But we usually what we find is that people really can um, walk through difficult times and, and get stronger on the other side. The literature kind of defines these characteristics as key aspects of resilience. So having some type of belonging a close attachment to at least one person for a child. Um, you know, usually that is a parent, but it could be a teacher, a coach, um, someone in the clergy, just one adult that they have um, trust and trust in and have a good relationship with. The ability to express and receive empathy, um, be authentic. We know that people who have an internal locus of control, so people that feel like they have some agency as opposed to feeling like a victim, like just things keep happening to them. Um, so if we feel like we can make a change in our situation and we can regulate and find balance, that is wonderful. And these are skills that we're helping kids foster, right, um, as parents. We're also helping our kids to learn how to problem solve. This is why it's so essential to not be a helicopter parent. If we're not allowing kids to practice, you know, problem solving, um, being creative and how they get through and find a solution. We need to let kids fail. Um, all of these little pieces of practice when they're young is building resilience and it will only make them stronger as they um, get to those teenage years and then launch so they can be independent. An ability to have confidence, have a positive self view, feel like you can take responsibility and have some mastery, insight, perspective, reframing. My goodness, my kid is so good at this. And I'm, I wish that I had his ability. He constantly and very authentically if something bad happens. I, you know, just before I came up to this presentation, I was letting him know that um, an exciting plan for tomorrow got canceled. And I was waiting for this huge disappointment. And it was a, oh, that's okay. Then we'll just have more time at home to have fun and watch a movie. Okay, great. He just reframed that beautifully. Um, if we can help our kids to do that instead of being always so disappointed and part of that's modeling as adults, um, if we can model how, gosh, yes, I am disappointed and now we can blah, 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 that's a great skill to have. And lastly, perseverance, realistic optimism. So I'm not talking about toxic positivity. I am talking about Finding, finding that bright spot, even in those really dark days, um, having some, some hope, being able to make meaning out of, out of trauma, out of disasters, um, having a belief in something bigger. There's so much research that shows that people who have some connection to spirituality, and that doesn't have to be religion, um, but just something bigger, like the concept of love or nature, the universe, those people tend to get through tough times much better with less distress than people who just feel like they've got nothing sort of there to hold them. Humor isn't necessarily listed in the literature, but I think it's important. And anecdotally, I'll say that I've, I've seen this as a key characteristic for families. Um, if you can laugh, man, that just sort of, it, it dissipates uh, the darkness. And for kids in particular, it's, I, I just, you know, I've heard so many great stories from parents about just like these terrible days where things just keep happening and going wrong. And then it's just like, you just start laughing because what else are you going to do? And then it's like dominoes and then the kids start laughing and then you're all laughing. And it's like, isn't this just ridiculous? Anytime that you can have that levity, it's like coming up for air um and, and it's necessary so even if you have to fake it till you make it watch a comedy listen to a funny podcast laughter yoga that's free you can go online and listen to laughter yoga tracks kids love that um the wonderful thing about laughter is even if you're faking it at first you still get the same great brain benefits um that you do if it's like authentic laughter so even if you have to fake a little bit try it out you might you might find a really great emotional release 
We know that in general, resilience is a combination of inner and outer strengths. Um, you know, in, in some ways, it's like the temperament we're born with, that babies are born with, will, um, you know, facilitate more or less resilience. But we also have to work at, at it. We have to practice all of those skills. And it is like a muscle that you can help your children build. Um, and it is similar to a muscle, it can atrophy. So if you're not practicing it, and if your kids aren't practicing it, it can, it can shrink and get weaker. So the more that we can help our kids practice these different um, resilient skills that we talked about, the better that they'll be able to push through. A couple of quotes that I love that relate to this. One is by Wendy Schlesel Harpum, who was a doctor who had cancer herself when she had children. She said, the greatest gift you can give your children is not protection from change, loss, pain, or stress, but the confidence and tools to cope and grow with all that life has to offer them. And Daniel Siegel and Tina Payne Bison, who write a lot about resilience, say, our job is to walk with our children through their difficult moments with connection and empathy, allowing them to feel, to be active participants in problem solving, and to discover the depth of their own capacity. It's out of our deep love for our children that we want to protect them, but their capacity will be greater if we allow that love to lead us to our own courage so that we can feel strong enough to let them discover their own strength. So now we're gonna take some of that information about resilience and pull it more specifically into cancer. And I wanna first reinforce that idea of systems um, this mobile here or the spider web or a couple of visual representations, your family is a system. And so, you know, the person that's diagnosed with cancer, if that it's one of the pieces on the model, if it's pulled on, it's going to pull the rest of the pieces with it. Same thing if, you know, cancer was a bug that got stuck in that spider web and it's struggling, it's going to pull all of that web with it. So we have to remember that even though there's one person in the family who has the cancer diagnosis, it most certainly is affecting everyone else in that family. What young children need when a loved one has cancer, I think can be boiled down to these three components. First, safe, reliable, and compassionate caregivers. Second, consistent routines and structure. And third, open, honest, and developmentally appropriate communication. Those three components will be woven into the rest of this here um, because I also see what well, kind of build the rest of this presentation on this, um, on the William Glasser's idea of how we build, um, get our different needs met. So of course, before we can get any need met, we have to feel safe. And that is the base of resilience. We're not resilient until we feel like we are safe in the world. Once we're safe, we can start to build on a sense of belonging. We can feel connected not only to ourselves, but at least to one other person. And once we feel like we have a sense of belonging, we have some power. We have some agency in this world. We can start thinking and doing and behaving and moving around and trying things out. Once we feel like we've mastered some of our power in a very healthy way, we have freedom, we have more independence. And with that then is fun. Um, we experience life, we experience joy, and we start to see that return on investment from the building of resilience. So going back to safety, like I said, none of us can really have anything met until we have safety. So if we apply that to young children and cancer, we know that um, for, for babies, for young children, the four S's are kind of the essential pieces. So babies need to feel safe, seen, soothed, and secured. And I would say that really is just a human need, all of those. So for young, young children, of course, the physical care for them and meeting their basic needs is the very first priority. Um, and so when we're thinking about um, parents and caregivers being gone because of treatment or travel, we really want to keep that, that, that care team very small and very consistent so that they, we can trust and know that they're meeting all those basic needs for young children. We also start to think about long-term planning. Um, and I know that this is an area that a lot of parents don't even want to think about because for some, it, and maybe it's even superstitious, they don't want to think about death. They don't want to think about dying. You're like, all I'm doing is putting my energy into fighting. And I get that. I've just heard from so many parents that they say, you know, I didn't want to make a will and decide on guardianship and all of that. 
but I did it. And I have to say, I feel so much better. Like, I feel like there's a monkey off my back. I also know there are kids and this was me. I was one of these kids when my dad had cancer. Um, I, I worried, like, I worried like, okay, when he dies, mom, and it's just me and you, like, what's going to happen now? What if you die? Because especially older kids, elementary school kids, they're going to start worrying. Um, you know, if, if one parent is sick or really, really sick and they think, oh my gosh, now, you know, if what's going to happen to you, or if it's a single parent, they're really going to worry. Like I just have you. And if you're gone now, what's going to happen to me? And kids are very egocentric as they should be. Like, they just worry about like, like what's going to happen to them. Who's going to make their lunch. Who's going to take them to school. So if you can tell them that you've made a plan and perhaps even engage them in that conversation, that doesn't work for all kids because if some kids are extremely anxious, this might make it worse. So you know your own kids the best. Um, but I know like I was a kid that I felt better when I had some say in like where I would go and what would happen and, and thought about all of those variables. When we think about belonging for young kids, certainly the family is first, like they feel that sense of belonging to their family. Um, for older kids and teens in particular, keep in mind that their family really are their friends. Peers are probably like the most important thing to teenagers. So they may need to be spending more and more time with friends than they are with the, with the family. And that can be a point of contention and arguments. But, um, and I know this conversation is focusing on young kids, but I do like to point that out. It's so important for the family to also have a support team because you're going to need that. You're exhausting yourselves, right? So as much as you can, build some kind of support team. If you can find a peer support uh, network, a community like a cancer support community, um, whether that's in-person, virtual, um, if it's at a school, church, it doesn't matter. Just for you as a parent, as an adult, to be connected with other parents that get it. And like I said, for those kids, they need that sense of connection. I'll never forget, we had um, a family night when I was at Gilda's Club Madison and where families would come together for dinner and for groups and everyone would go to their own groups. Parents would have their groups, kids would have theirs. And there was a family that had been coming for a long, long time. And I had gotten a call during the day from a dad saying, that his wife was, was home and actively dying and that he didn't think that he and his children would be coming that night because they probably, the kids would just want to stay home with, with mom. And then they showed up and, and I said, oh, I didn't, I didn't think to see that I would see you guys. And he said, well, when the kids got home and I said that we wouldn't be coming tonight, they were so upset. And they said, this is a night that we definitely need to come dad. Like we need our people. We need, I need to talk to my other friends. I need to tell them what's happening to mom and I need to be with them tonight. And I think that really showcases that, you know, that sense of connection and belonging that that is what, you know, that's what those kids wanted is they wanted to at least be with their friends who understood. So never underestimate how important that connection is for kids. Even that sense of validation of for kids to show up and see other moms without hair, other dads using canes, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, for young kids, that, that sense of normalcy is really important. And at school, it's not normal that they have a bald mom. But if they go to a play date and there are three other bald moms, all of a sudden they're normal and it's fine and it's cool. That's, that's very empowering for them. Once they have a sense of belonging, they can start to play with some power. And really I consider some of the, the building blocks here is that open, honest communication and tools to help them cope. And as I talk through this, remember that Every kid's age and development, personality, unique qualities are going to play into this. And you know your kids the best. So you decide what makes the most sense for your unique kid. And even if you have, if you had twins, um, they might be very different kids, right? And you might have to talk to them and work with them very differently. Like I said earlier, the thing you cannot tell your kids enough is that cancer is not their fault. Nothing they sit, said, did, thought, made their loved one get cancer. And I have worked with young adults who have told me, okay, I know, I know it's silly that I think this, but I had a really big fight with my dad. And then the next day he told me he had stage four cancer and I can't help but feel like a part of me, like, did I cause that? And they have, they, they have no more um, magical thinking developmentally, like they've aged out of that. But there, I feel like there's always that tiny part of us that feels that way. So for a kid that truly does have magical thinking, you need to reassure them like they did not cause it. 
you also want to reassure them they cannot catch it, especially in the world of COVID. Um, you know, everything, we're just constantly worried about germs and catching things. Um, I think one way to help in this is I try to use the word and the phrase cancer uh, because the word sick, usually to me, I think that that's a little bit more ambiguous and can mean contagious. So I try to use the word cancer um, and say, you can hug and snuggle mom or dad. You'll never catch it. You are perfectly safe. I also like to remind kids that it's an open dialogue. Um, because this is never a one and done. So anytime you have conversations, it's like, a, anytime you have a question, please ask. And you'll want to check in with them as well, but try to remind them that it's an open doorway and they can come talk to you. And if you don't have the answer, you'll tell them and then you'll figure out how to go find the right answer. Use short, simple phrases. And, and I don't know about you, I'm, well, I'm always expanding. I, so this is hard for me. Like I'm talking super, super, super short, you know, edit down your sentences. Um, you can start to expand, of course, as, as their development allows for it, but keep it really short and sweet. Try to include words that you know your child is gonna overhear. So if you know you're going to have chemotherapy, radiation, if you're going through immunotherapy, I mean, use these big words and then try to explain it to them in a way that makes sense. It'll help you out. There's some really great kid glossaries online that are free that will help you to make it easier to understand because I mean, these concepts are difficult for adults to understand. So we're trying to make it simple for them. Avoid metaphors as much as possible. Um, Sometimes this works. There are some kids that this works well for in like maybe elementary school children. And there's some, a lot of books will use metaphors, but like the cancer monster and things like that. But for young kids, it can be super confusing because they're very concrete thinkers, especially if you're talking about death and dying. We definitely want to use those words. And I know we live in a very death phobic culture and it's scary to use those words, but it's scary to us for adults because we're the ones that have the baggage. Kids don't. Kids are pretty open to talking about that. So if if a parent is dying, we really want to say a parent is dying, not like your parent is going away. Um, parent is going to sleep. That then your kid will never sleep again. Um, don't use those euphemisms. Just call it death and dying. Consider planning out your message before. And if you want to practice, find a best friend, use your therapist, whoever it is, um, and they can give you some feedback. Like if you're just feeling really anxious and wanting to get some tips and feedback about how to deliver news, practice. And I, this is maybe my, my own issue, but I've, I've heard other parents say the same thing. I really try to avoid the word promise. Um, especially, please, please, please don't ever promise your kid that you're never going to die because that's a lie. Um, we're all going to die. Um, and all it will do is damage the trust that your child has in you. So really consider that when you're selecting words um, and, and try not to overpromise because we always want our kids to, to be able to trust us and be able to think that they can come to us and we'll tell them the truth. This is an example of some of those like short, short sentences that you can almost like cut and paste and build together. So, you know, mommy has cancer, stop, pause. She's going to the doctor to get better. She's getting a medicine called chemotherapy. The medicine may make mommy feel sick and tired. You can hug and snuggle mommy all you want and you will never catch cancer. Nothing you did or said caused mommy to get cancer. You can always ask us questions about cancer or how mommy feels. A few more snippets about communication. Like I said before, follow your gut. I mean, it's, that's a real thing. Like follow that parental gut and what makes the most sense. Remember that kids are unique and each one has their own special approach. Consider timing. You know, if your kid has like a big game tomorrow, uh, maybe like don't have some really big update right before the game or at bedtime. I know kids like to bring up big topics at bedtime, but you as the parent don't because you want your kid to fall asleep. Um, so just think about like, and you know, again, you know your kids the best. If you know they're most receptive at six in the morning, maybe wake up early and have that conversation then. Um, a lot of kids, in fact, most kids, they do better having conversations when you're engaging, like engaging in play, drawing a picture, side by side is the best, um, or in the car when they're behind you. What doesn't work for most kids is like this face-to-face. -face. It's very vulnerable. It's very intimidating. Kids don't know what to do with that face-to-face. -face. Um, so try to have conversations, especially big ones, where you're kind of side to side, not forced to look at each other. 
showing emotions, that's very appropriate. I've had so many parents ask me like, is it okay to cry in front of my kid? Of course it's okay to cry in your front of your kid. Um, you know, ideally you don't have like a major breakdown where you feel like your kid feels like they have to take care of you. But, but even if you did, the wonderful thing about being a parent is role modeling and you can always feel your feeling, take time to regulate and then come back and say, oh my goodness, I was, I was feeling so sad. Like I just was feeling so sad. I got this news. I'm not, I'm just not feeling good about it. And I felt like the only thing I could do was cry. And I have to tell you, I actually feel better now that I cried. It was, I, that might've been scary for you. And we can talk about how that felt for you, but I feel better now and I'm ready to talk. So role model, role model, what to do with emotions, how to express, emo, express emotions. These are great learning experiences. Okay, we talked about euphemisms. Listen for the underlying message. Um, I, this was like, the, I had one in particular, a parent was telling me um, that her older son was asking her, are, are you going to be at my band concert next month? And she said, well, oh, yeah, of course I like, I'm going to come. And later that night she realized what he meant was, are you still going to be alive next month? And that took her like, you know, her little parent radar. It took a minute to kind of figure that out. And that's what I mean by like, listen to that parent gut. She knew her kid and that he couldn't, he didn't feel brave enough to directly ask that question, but she had the intuition enough to figure that out and then circle back and say, when you, when you ask, this question, did you mean this? And then they had a great conversation. So just kind of keep, keep that in mind. A lot of kids are going to do best when you can prepare them for changes. Um, and this is for most, most humans. Like if we have an idea of what's coming, we can prepare for it. So if you know that treatment starts in a month, you know, maybe start letting them know two weeks ahead of time and then remind them again, like the week before and the day before of what that's going to look like. And most importantly, how it's going to change things for them. They don't really care what it means for you, but like how will it affect them? And then wash, rinse, repeat. This is never a one and done. You're gonna have to keep circling back to these, to these points. Um, regulating feelings, one of the best things you can help your kids with. If you know the handy brain, you can Google that. Um, it'll help you to um, respond to your kids who are having really big emotions. Because what we know is if a kid is in the middle of tantruming or experiencing really big emotion, that is not the time to have a conversation. They, it will not, they, their brains will not process it. So we always need to help kids to work through big emotions before we have verbal conversations with them. Helping your kid to understand the, the purpose of some of our basic emotions. And as a parent, actually, it's kind of a nice roadmap. Like if our kids are feeling afraid, it's telling us like, what do we need to pay attention to? If we're, if we're feeling really angry, what are we fighting for? What do we want? If we're feeling sad, what are we trying to let go of? And if we're happy, like, what are we celebrating? How do we want to feel joyful? There are so many different ways to process these emotions. And I want to highlight physical activity, because I think we're getting better um, as parents and as humans to integrate play and art and expression into our feelings. Sometimes the kinesthetic part gets left out when regarding feelings, um, especially anger. I think we get a little bit afraid of anger, but we don't always need to, in fact, and it would caution us to make sure we're leaving room to be physical with our anger in a safe way. So helping your kid to find safe ways to be angry, to punch a pillow, to throw ice cubes outside, let them, you know, if you want to break things, throwing ice cubes now is getting hot and like watch it melt. They can go from a really kinesthetic activity to really meditative, um, yelling, screaming, all that kind of stuff belly breathing, grounding techniques, being able to not just cry, but wail. Like even older kids, if they're in elementary school, sometimes being able to almost tantrum like a toddler might be what they need. Um, and we don't want to put judgment on that. If they can do that in a safe way and get some of these feelings out, how wonderful. Play is a child's work. And that is how children will process through a lot of their worries and feelings. Um, it's great to both engage with your children in their play. And that like, if they're telling a story about the dinosaur mommy going to the hospital, join in, play with. Sometimes it's nice to just kind of listen and watch. Sometimes it's nice to join in. Um, I've had so many art therapists tell me like, please make sure parents know that play reflects like this quote here, an emotional reality, it is not an exact retelling of what they're actually thinking about. So if you're in that play and all of a sudden the dinosaur mommy starts ripping apart the daddy dinosaur, um, 
you might, because you might start thinking like, oh my gosh, what does my kid think about my relationship with my husband? What's going on? Try not to psychoanalyze, uh, just keep playing and, and just kind of see. And you can always ask kids afterwards, like, huh, like I noticed, you can always just say, I just noticed. I love that. That's a great intervention. You don't have to be a therapist to use it. Just, I noticed you did this. See if they say anything or like, oh, tell me more about, um, you know, just kind of like see what comes up. And if, if you're starting to get just feelings like red flags, like eh, this just doesn't feel right. That's when you can reach out for extra support, but by and large, you usually don't need to engage any kind of therapist. Um, a lot of this can just be done at home with your kids. Artistic expression is so important. Um, there's so many things that you can do with your kids. Uh, again, you don't have to be a therapist, an art therapist to do them, but just playing with clay and drawing out like our bodies, like a body map of where we feel things, do collage, make a, a family flag of a crest and hang it up in your living room about what makes your family so strong and resilient and wonderful. Similar to that story of um, an underlying message. Uh, I remember once in a group, uh, it was the very first kids support group and there was a young boy when they were drawing their families dad had cancer and he drew a gun pointing at dad's head and he didn't want to share about it in group and that's fine. But after group, I just pulled mom aside and I said, just so you know, um, you might want to check in with your son. This was like, just ask him about his drawing. He didn't really want to talk about it in group. And she was a little bit upset. And I said, try not to be upset. Like just wait until tomorrow, sleep on it and see if he wants to talk tomorrow. And she called me the next day and said, so I had that conversation and it turns out um, so dad had a, a brain tumor and was getting radiation and this little boy was kind of kept in the dark and he, he only had heard snippets of information and what he had put together again was much scarier than the truth. He just imagined the scary like alien ray gun at dad's head. And so they had a wonderful family communication about what radiation treatment really looked like for dad and then one step better they were able to arrange for that son to come to dad's next treatment and the medical team left time ahead of time to take him on a tour, show them the machine and explained everything. And guess what? His stress level came down a lot because he now was like informed, right? So there might be elements of, you know, worries, questions, stress coming through in your children's drawings and art. And this is, so it's a great way to use that um, for conversation. Of course, any element of mindfulness, I suggest do that as a family. It's a really great family activity to do some yoga, belly breathing, whatever it is, share gratitudes at dinner. Information, children's books, wonderful. As kids get older, be wary of what they're Googling and what the, like what's reliable information. So start having conversations with older children about like, where they should go to look for information. Uh, we talked about the power of routines. Uh, a lot of kids, sometimes parents feel, <laughs> they kind of want feel like, oh, I should give my kid a break. Like I'm going through, we're going through so much. I'm not going to expect so much of them. That actually freaks kids out. I've heard that so often from especially older kids that say, my mom used to ask that I clean my room or make my bed every day. And she stopped asking. And that actually worried me because I thought like, you know, she used to be so uptight about it and like things must be really bad that she doesn't care about me making my bed or I started getting B's instead of A's and but my mom doesn't care and I guess she must be really sick. So, um, you know, the, some of those expectations and routines structure are really important for kids. They're extremely important for young, young kids. Um, as Sarah Ulsher points out, I've been to a lot of her presentations Um that, you know, as adults, we have planners, right? And where would we be without our phone, our calendar about what's happening when? Like if you lost that and you had to go through your week, I bet your level of stress would be through the roof because you're, you're not sure where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be doing. So little kids need that too. And we need to make ways that are very accessible for them. So she makes these really great pictorial schedules and you don't even have, you can buy them through her. You can make your own at home. You can do it for free where you just put together a simple week calendar and pictures for kids that don't read of like, if a, have a picture of grandma and when grandma's coming to stay, when is she coming to stay? The days you're gonna be at treatment, have a picture of the hospital. Days that you know you're going to be really sick from treatment, maybe put that on there. Anything that will help your kids to know what to expect in the next week will be very empowering. And then lastly, once the kids start to have this sense of power, they'll feel more freedom and more independence. They'll be able to feel more like a kid. 
And lastly, some fun. And really fun can coexist, it coexists with cancer. Um, this was a family I knew from Gilda's Club who were happy to share this picture for a presentation. Um, this little girl's mom was going through treatment at the time and had a wig and they wanted to build a snowman and they went in and stole mom's wig and put it on the snowman. And they just, they laugh about it still about, and again, there's that laughter piece. They just had a blast with it. So, you know, it's, it's okay to have fun and laugh. Now, just to get a little bit before the end here, I know we're running short on time, um, about distress. And this is where I think parents get the most worried is like, how will I know if my kid needs extra help? I love this um, poem by Shel Silverstein, The Smile Makers. The grungy, grumpy, grouchy giant grew tired of his frowny pout and hired me and Lee to lift the corners of his crumbling mouth. That was last year, and we've been here sweating, straining all the while. Sometimes it sure can be hard work to make somebody smile. And I have this poem because this is what I hear from kids sometimes um, when they have their own special support group and parents aren't around, they'll say, sometimes I feel like I have to help daddy smile. Like daddy doesn't smile anymore. Daddy's always sad. Um, I think it's, maybe it's about me. Maybe I'm not, you know, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not doing well enough in school. It's because I, you know, did so poorly on my piano recital, whatever it is. Um, kids will really sometimes take on the weight and I know that no parent, no parent ever wants their child to feel that way. Um, so I just, I put this here as just a way to kind of remind parents that, th that kids sometimes do feel like it's their responsibility. And so it never hurts to remind them like they should just be a kid and that you are being taken care of by a great medical team. You've got great helpers that you've got this, like you've got your support team. And so what you want from your kid is snuggles. You want them to be happy. You want them to play with your, their friends. You want them to go to school, whatever it is, like remind them to be a kid. It's not their job to take care of you. I think parents really will feel the distress. Like if you notice that something has just been off for two weeks or more, uh, disturbances in the big four are kind of the key. So like developmentally, uh, if, if your kid was potty trained and now they've regressed, they started wetting the bed a lot, um, they're uh, doing poorly in school, eating too much, too little, um, sleeping too much, too little. If all those things have really been off, um, it may be time to check in with your pediatrician, um, a social worker, your oncology social worker, see if you can get a referral to a kid therapist, just, just someone that can maybe kind of give you some feedback because extra support is never a bad thing. Um, any kind of persistent change in mood or pattern and change in mood or patterns of behavior is, is what will kind of key you to, to paying attention. Any explosive behaviors, withdrawing, if your kid used to be really social and now is really isolated, you might want to pay attention to that. Also, um, this role shifts. This, this is really for older kids. Sometimes I see preteens, teens take on like a parenting role. They feel like they have to take care of the younger siblings. Some of that can be healthy. Um, but if they're doing too much of it and they're then they're doing it all at the cost of school and friends and extracurriculars, um, you know, you might want to bring in some extra help to give them a break. There are so many great ways to connect with professional and peer support. If you're going to look for a therapist, try to find one that not only understands the family system, but also at least chronic illness. Maybe they don't have an expertise in cancer, but they understand like a chronic illness. For young children, um, because they don't really do talk therapy, you're looking for a play therapist, art therapist. If your child has experienced a trauma, like if they saw you fall down and like had to call for an ambulance or something like that. That's really scary. That's keeping them up at night. EMDR is a really great modality that even young kids can do. Um, that doesn't use words that they can like a therapist therapist can walk them through getting rid of some of the distress of those, those visual memories. Child life specialists are phenomenal. They're at most clinics and hospitals. So you might not know of them. Ask, you know, ask a doctor, nurse, social worker, if there's one that can help your family out. School counselors, don't forget, if you have kids at a school, that they're a great resource. They might even be able to help connect you to other families to have play dates with. They can be a resource for your kid while they're at school. I mean, your kid is there for how many hours a day? And it's great that your kid knows they can go to someone that they can trust if they're having a hard time at school. If you're a part of a spiritual community, there might be leaders there. Like I said in the presentation, peer support is essential, I feel. So if you can get connected to some kind of peer support, not only for you as the adult, but for your kids. And then camps, there's some really great camps, including Camp Kesem, that are really fabulous for children.
So I just want to end wrap this up by saying I did um, uh, some research in 2008 looking at resilience in families facing cancer. Um, I did some interviews with parents and teens and truly what I found out this is from both teens older kids and parents is that while cancer sucked and they wish they never had to go through it. It did teach kids how to build empathy, how to be a good friend, a good partner, a good parent. I had teens tell me like, I know they were a little bit dramatic about it, but you know, saying, well, now that I understand, you know, my mom having cancer, like, you know, my friends are just worried about their girlfriend or, you know, getting their driver's license. And I feel like I have a greater appreciation for life and the bigger things. And that's coming from like a 16 year old that builds empowerment and confidence. It gives them some life perspective and certainly gratitude. I just want to end with this quote, life is not fair, life hurts, life is good. These three seemingly incompatible expressions are really three parts of the whole of living. They are threads woven through the tapestry each one of us creates as the visible expression of being part of humanity. To accept these three is not to abandon hope or optimism or to deny our real grief. To accept them is to rid ourselves of the unnecessary suffering that comes from struggling against these three truths and trying to make them something they're not. I encourage you to reach out to me. I'm going to, I know that I went a little long. Um, I'm gonna stay on to answer questions, but if you have to drop off, please write down that um, my email address. I encourage anyone to reach out to me via email. Um, I'm always happy to talk more or help get you connected to either our programs or other programs that are more local for you or um, even other national virtual programs. So I will stop there and start answering questions. Hey, thank you so much, Krista. Uh, that presentation was honestly really great. I'm glad we were able to, you know, also record this so it lives, you know, on and on and on. So, uh, yes, let's go ahead and get to the questions. Uh, hopefully we can answer a few before the top of, the, you know, even a little bit after. Um, so one of the questions that we did get through registration was, I know you touched upon this uh, through your presentation, but somebody asked, how helping my young son to understand I can't hold him, it's not because I don't want to all of a sudden. That is so hard. And I think that's one of the primary concerns I get from parents of young kids, right? Where they no longer, like they might have to wean before they're ready. They can no longer pick up their children. And that, that physical connection is so important for us with our kids. I get it. And it, it's a loss, not only for you as the parent, but for the child. Um, and then also sometimes it can create some resentment because then um, if like, if you have a partner and now they're having more physical touch with the kid, the kid might start preferring that other parent. And I've heard that as a problem. So I recognize and I validate how big of a problem that can be. Um, I think it's going to just in involve a lot of repetition and reminding your kiddo, you know, saying like, you know, I, I hurt right here, you know, and, and I wish I, I, you know, I want to, I want to hold you so badly. And I'm sad that I can't hold you in the same way. Um, but my body hurts right here. How can we, how can we touch in different ways? So mm -hmm. I've had parents find new and creative ways to have that physical touch with kids. Is it lying side by side? Um, maybe it's like looking at each other and like talking and having silly games. It might be almost like spooning each other. Um, massages, body touches. That's something that my child even still asks for, like at bedtime, would you please give me a back rub? Will you touch my feet? Um, there are so many different ways that don't involve picking or holding that you can still get that wonderful vitamin T, the vitamin touch, that sensation going. Um, and I know it's hard because young kids are going to forget and they're going to be like, pick me up, pick me up, hold me. And it's like, oh gosh. And you just kind of quickly remind them, oh no, I can't, let's do this instead. It's like redirecting them to another way to have that connection. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, let's see how to introduce cancer to a little one when a grandparent has it. Mm, yep. I mean, I think everything in this presentation still applies. It'll, it'll likely be less distressing for a kid because it's not their immediate caregiver. They may be more open to ask questions then because it feels perhaps a little bit more removed. It's not like in the immediate family. But I think, uh, again, all of what was said in this presentation, books are great. There are some very, there are books specific to grandma with cancer, um, grandpa with cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, I would use those. There are some great videos online too that, and there's like an Arthur episode that has like a lunch lady with cancer. So I think there are many different ways to introduce that concept of cancer and to start answering questions. 
Um, and, you know, like I said in the presentation, even, you know, young, young kids pick up on this. Like even babies, while they do not have the cognition and the verbal skills, they will pick up on a change in caregiver um, and who's holding them. Um, they sense that. And I remember like our executive director says all the time in her presentations that she would talk to her baby. And she said, I'm not even sure if it really helped my baby, but it helped me. And it was like, we had this authentic connection. Um, like while I was breastfeeding and weaning that I could like tell my baby I had cancer, but that I loved them and I was getting treatment. I encourage that. I mean, they're on some level, even babies are picking up on the tone and the comfort and the emotions of what's going on. So I don't think it's ever too early to talk to kids. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, let's see. Another question was um, how to talk with kids about a terminal diagnosis. Yeah, I know that's always a question and it's always a hard one. Um, just that I facilitate our stage four group for parents with cancer. And this last week, you know, we talked about this. I mean, th this, like, this was not ever something you wanted to have to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, no parent wants to tell their kid that they're dying. It's awful. And it's so full of emotion. So the first thing I was like, I just want to validate how awful that is. And it's really important that I think you find someone that you can talk to about having that conversation because you need someone to just give you support about how tough it is as much as possible. It's just being honest. Um, and I've, I've had parents, I've had parents do very different things based on what they think is best for their kids. So truly, I don't think there's like one right answer. So, you know, some people say like, oh, you have to tell kids. There may be reasons why you don't or that you wait. Um, like I know I had one mom who, who had stage four cancer and she knew that she was, she was dying, but it wasn't immediate and she still looked healthy. And she said, you know, my kids are kind of anxious. They tend towards worry. They were young kids, like, you know, five, I think five and six. And she said, like, do I, do I have to tell them? I mean, I don't know. I, my answer was, I don't think you do as long as, cause she was so, you know, so attuned to her kids' needs. And I think what I've noticed is for a lot of young kids, especially if they tend towards anxiety, for them having that conversation of you dying is probably best when you actually start to physically look like you're dying. Because for a lot of kids, the disconnect is, is confusing. Yeah. But they see you as healthy. They're like, what do you mean you're dying? Like you have your hair, you're, you're taking me to soccer. Like, what do you mean you're dying? Mm -hmm. um, as you start to you know progress and you start to feel sicker, look sicker, then is when you might want to start having those conversations of you might've noticed, you know, I'm more tired. I have to spend more time in bed. My body is starting to shut down. Um, those are hard. Those are hard conversations. And you just want to take it at the speed that your kid is ready. It might be that your kid at this point can benefit from some extra support and some therapy. Um, I know, speaking of Sarah Ulster, I know that she's working on a book right now that specifically talks about how to talk to kids about dying. Because while there are some really great grief books, there really aren't books for people who are dying that want to help their kid understand like how the body shuts down. Um, and so there will be a book soon about that. There's another great book for parents who have advanced cancer called the cancer that wouldn't go away. Mm -hmm. That's one of the only books I know for like people who have advanced cancer because so many children's books end with like, you go through treatment, you're all better. Yay. But there are so many parents that know they'll live with their cancer forever and they don't know how long it is. It might be 20 years, it might be two weeks, um, but that they'll always live with cancer. And so that ambiguous timeline is so confusing and that helps some young children to live with like what it means to have good days and bad days. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was such a great answer. Um, and then I think one of our last questions will be, um, somebody's asking about long-term planning for a caregiver. Uh, like what to do? Are there any resources of how to get started or, you know, things like yep, that? Yeah, I know. And I feel like that's so overwhelming because not only is the actual process overwhelming, of course, it's emotionally overwhelming. I really love, you know, Triage Cancer is such a wonderful organization and they have great resources on their website that can help you begin that process. So if you're thinking about you know, estate planning, long-term planning, guardianship, all that kind of stuff, um, I might start there. Um, if you if you have the resources, just make an appointment with a lawyer and you feel like that's the easiest, quickest, most efficient way to just like go have an appointment, get it done. That's, you know, that's an option. Um, but I do think, I, I mean, I, I do think it is beneficial because it, it allows you to put things in order 
so that you can put it away and then focus on the here and now and focus on your medical treatment, focus on having energy for your kids, being with your family. And you don't just have that in the back of your mind, that worry of like, what's going to happen, you know, financially, legally, because those worries can really drain you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Carissa, again, for your time, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I know this is going to be such a great resource for our community, especially the ones who couldn't attend today. But this recording will be up in a few weeks in our video library. And as Carissa said, if you had any further questions, I did drop her um, email in the chat. Or you can also email us if you need. Um, you know, we do have a parent group as well. And a uh, a child, teen, and family programming, things like that. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to email us at info at cancersupportla.org. And I'll drop that in the chat as well. But again, thank you so much, Carissa, for everything and for everyone attending today. I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. You have a good day. Bye.